Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Med School Minutes podcast, where we discuss what it takes to attend and successfully complete a medical program. This show is brought to you by St. James School of Medicine. Here is your host, Kashik Gua. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Med School Minutes, where we talk about everything MD with a focus on uh, international students, specifically students from the Caribbean. Today, we have a very special guest, another one of our uh, St. James alum, who is uh, Dr. Larissa Liu, and she is just in her first year of practice, and she's licensed in New York. So we're going to talk to her about her experience in med school, um, the process of matching, and eventually the process of getting a license in uh, New York, which um, uh, contrary to popular belief is perfectly doable. And as Dr. Lou is going to uh, talk about more, it's, it's, it's a cumbersome process, but everybody can do it. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Lou. Thank you so much, Dr. Lou, for taking the time out and talking to us. Um, you are an alumni of, uh, or an alumnus of St. James School of Medicine. And uh, thank you once again for, you know, uh, taking the time. So uh, why don't you start with telling us a little bit about your background and what got you interested in medicine? Why did you choose St. James? And what was your first reaction when you landed on the island? <laughs> All right. Yes. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Um, so I am from small town, Pennsylvania, born and raised. Um, Went to undergrad, a very small private university. And then right after that, um, you know, you start thinking about medicine. And I thought about medicine very early on in life. So it's kind of the only thing I ever really allowed myself to think about, honestly. Um, and then, you know, you take some of the tests and you do the things and you get a little discouraged. Um, but then, you know, I had very supportive family and they just said, you know, keep trying, you know, find other avenues. And that's when St. James kind of popped up into, uh, it was actually one of my family members. Um, and she had, she had found um, your website and looked through everything. And she kind of just sent it my way. And that night I applied. <laughs> so, you know, it was a happy accident and a great find. And, you know, it was kind of uphill ever since. <laughs> um, when I came to Anguilla, it was, I didn't realize how small of an island it actually was. I never heard of it or knew even where it was on the map. So it was very uh, shocking for somebody who's never really, you know, been out in that area or has really done much traveling beside that of Pennsylvania. Um, but, you know, you, you once I got there and, you know, you meet the students in the town and it was really a welcoming country overall and it was very nice to okay. really see how down to earth the people were overall right and uh so anguilla has a population of fifteen thousand. you and can then, go from one end of the island to the other in what 20 minutes or so that's <laughs> but it is a very close-knit community uh crime is very very low if there is any i know that they have <laughs> one one jail cell and this is a few years ago. I was visiting the island and the uh, cab driver who was taking me from the ferry at the time to my hotel. And he was he, he seemed really animated about something. And I was like, well, what's going on? I was like, oh, no, actually, we have one jail cell and that's actually full. Yeah. So <laughs> even he, there's nowhere to keep any other person if they were to break the law. So Only I was like, does one. that affect? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so it's it's to your point, Anguilla being such a small uh, island, I think that that's great. However, what about the beaches? Oh, the most beautiful you'll ever see in your life. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly, without a doubt. Right? <laughs> yes, and, everyone, everyone and, you went to, they all had their different charms, but all right. beautiful. Right, right, yeah. right, and um, and I think that that's uh, it's it's a very idyllic place. Uh, and yeah. I think it's ideal for um, uh, students because there really isn't much else. To, and and see, so you lived the student life there. So correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but there isn't much to do beyond studying. Is that right? Pretty much. Yeah, I was studying in the beach and, you know, find your friends. And that's kind of it. <laughs> Those were your three options. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so um, since you mentioned studying, and I seem to have a lot of... Um, 
differences of opinion, to put it mildly, with a lot of our current students about how much should you be studying? And and I, I know that this might be uh, a little off the cuff or, or unofficial, so to speak. But And I ask this for every one of our alumni who are successful. Um, is there a certain marker or time limit that, hey, if you're not studying at least this much outside of class hours, that's a red flag. Was there anything like that for you? Um, you know, looking back, I definitely think I should have studied more. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm being very <laughs> honest. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, class days are, they're long and there are moments where That's you're up. definitely not paying attention anymore because, you know, everything's stretched right. thin. You got a lot of information in a whole day or even just your last class. Um, so, you know, my roommate and I, we definitely found it, um, a, at least a mini a minimum of kind of like an hour of solid like on our own talking through some things just really kind of going back into the day and okay i don't remember that let's start about, you know things like that it was really kind right. of a renewal day um okay. or at the end of every day um at minimum of what would be at least an hour but that one you know of requiring us to really having had paid attention in the day during you know those classes so it was a lot more reflection and then a little bit more review at that point but okay um i mean even after even while in residency um you know at least an hour of reading on top of you know what you're doing then Uh, uh, so 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 right now classes are give or give or take about six to eight hours a day and on (laughs) top of that you are suggesting at least one hour every single day yeah. So that's and actually that not too has, bad. It's, yeah, yeah it sounds pretty reasonable, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is, it is. But, <laughs> but that's what I, we get I, there I, for, too. Yeah, and then I, I kind of get where students are coming from. Studying seven, eight hours a day is mentally very exhausting, and then coming back. Absolutely. But um, this time when I went uh, to both of the islands, I actually I was so uh, exhilarated to see that a bunch of our students were just sitting on the beach with their legs dangling in the water and they had their <laughs> books with them and they were all studying and quizzing each other. And I was like, man, that yeah. that group, that's going to do really, really well. <laughs> and just as soon as classes were over, they sat there. They took a very, really nice vantage point where they could see the sunset. So while watching there. the sunset, talking to each other um, and, and uh, just enjoying the beach while studying. And I was like, you know that's how it should be done and i i you know i was looking at them and i was like man i wish i had that kind of environment when i was in school i, I just had yeah walls it, and it's you know. a unique opportunity when you're in an overly stressful situation right. um you know medical school on an island or medical school you know in the states or anywhere else it's always stressful no matter which way you right. put it but the ability to be on the island and having you know those views and those beaches and the ability to decompress was right you know it's definitely more unique and adds a, a valuable piece to your education overall i think right that's awesome and uh <laughs> so for us emily uh you weren't obviously in classes when you took the step ones or the steps right. um right. do you remember how much you were dedicatedly studying for the steps step one oh. in particular oh my gosh i mean a ballpark um, number i was terrified so i went okay. nuts i was doing I, I, I mean, it was all day, every day. Um, you know, you oh, take wow. a little break here and there. Um, a standardized tests terrify me. I don't know how yes. I'm a doctor because they terrify me. <laughs> but, but, but you must be good at it. <laughs> Honestly, I, you know, I can't, who knows anymore. Um, but yeah, I, I was at minimum, it was minimum six hours. Um, and six that, hours. you know, that, yeah, at minimum. Um, and that was really just kind of depending on, how did the question bank go that day? You know, when, okay. you know, did I, you know, fumble through some things or, you know, it, it kind of varied, you know, you have a schedule and you try and stick to it as best you can. Um, but not every day is going to flow that way. Um, and that's okay. kind of the big piece with this step studying is it's not, you know, that linear path of studying. It never will be right. once you're past step one, step two, all of them, even in residency, right. they don't flow that well. Um, okay. Because you have a lot of things that play into it. Um, right. And, you know, step one is a beast. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, so, yeah. You know, it requires a little bit different things. And it's your first step exam. Whereas the ones after that are like, okay, I've done this already. 
things like that okay. tend to take a little bit of the edge off. Okay. And um, so I, I read an AAMC article, American Association of Medical Colleges article that says that at an average, the American student uh, studies for about uh, eight weeks at the minimum for about uh, nine to 12 hours a day. That's the average that they found from polling students. But uh, it seems like uh, you probably were right there in, in that particular average. And But once you finish the step, you started your rotations in Chicago. Is that right? And uh, Yes, at every single rotation in okay. Chicago. And uh, what were your impressions of the impression, uh, rotations in Chicago, generally speaking? Um, generally, um, pretty good overall. You know, there were certain rotations where you have a lot of students, so your ability to really get a handle on some of the things was not as good as others, um, you know, which you figure out early on and then you can kind of make up for that with regards to electives and such later on. Um, but, you know, working with MHC and things like that was a smooth adjustment and having the schedule kind of in place in advance worked worked well. And uh, so now the big thing is obviously after ro uh, rotations, you go to residency. Now in residency, for some reason or the other. And and where did you, why don't you tell us where you got your residency? Oh, yes. I did residency at St. Luke's um, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Okay. So uh, the big question for that is um, people, some, some for some reason or the other, and, and I don't really know why, maybe you can shed some light on that, is that they keep thinking that you cannot get residency in Pennsylvania or uh, New York or New Jersey. And I really have no idea where that rumor, so to speak, comes from. And everybody says, that, oh, yeah, if you're an IMG, you're never getting a license in New York. But currently, if I'm not mistaken, you are licensed in New York. So what was that experience yes, for you? Yes, just long enough. Yeah. Yeah. So what was that experience for you? Like um, so, you know, matching um, in general is stressful. Um, I think, you know... I know many people that have actually matched in New yeah. York, in Pennsylvania. Um, so it's not a, you know, it's not this giant hurdle that it's made out to be. Um, a lot of the times what I found is that most of these programs really want somebody who, you know, enjoys the area. In similar fashion, you know, when we do rotations with residents, um, you know, we look to go into match there because it's kind of, that familiar territory, a lot of those things, and that similar thought process with a lot of program directors and such. Um, so the matching and things in Pennsylvania and New York is very doable, and they're extremely IMG friendly. Okay. Um, program directors, uh, you know, you'll find more of a diversity within those programs than anything. Right. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, I, I remember hearing a lot of things when I was going into the match, you know, don't apply oh, to New okay. York or Pennsylvania or these areas. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah, I heard you, you hear it all. It's like, don't even bother. Right, right, right. Like, you're never in an interview. Um, and I think a lot of it had to do with they thought like accreditation things or like, mm -hmm. you know, lots of rumor mills spread and they right. light on fire. Um, I'm like, but it really, you know, all of my interviews were in Pennsylvania. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, you get, yeah, so you get, um, it's it's not an impossibility and really um, they do take IMGs quite considerably in most areas, okay. um, whether you're applying rurally or big city. Okay. Um, with regards to licensure in New York, that was probably a worse than match. Really? To be quite honest. Why is that? Um. I I wish I knew. Um, I have had many people not have an issue. Um, other IMGs, they've gotten it within, you know, the normal time frame of like six to eight weeks or so, uh, whereas it took me four months. Um, <laughs> and that required lots of phone calls and, you know, climbing up the ranks in order to get things kind of moved along. Um, I think knowing what I know now and had gone through... Um, I would definitely let other, you know, people looking to apply for a licensure or working in New York is to really have close contact with your rotations, your prior rotations, who you did them with. Make sure, you know, because you get, you get all the information, you know, as 
I reached out to with regards to the school and, you know, St. James was very quick about getting me my entire list and everything sent quickly. Um, but, you know, when you have to think about all those rotations before program directors, the hospitals, the paperwork runs and becomes a bit of a bear. So, you know, staying with, um, fortunately, I was in the position, you know, where I did everything with MHC and I was fortunate that they only required me to fill out, you know, one form. Um, but the, the the thing I would caution is when you apply for a license in New York is that really their, their licensing website is where you're going to get every piece of information in every possible format. There are, you know, links and links upon links. Um, and it does become a little daunting, um, with which forms you need and, um, well, you know, when you do or do not need to fill out something. Um, so it's, if you're planning on getting a license in New York or you're looking at jobs, I would highly recommend starting the process for licensing sooner rather than later so you can get all your ducks in a row in the event that, you know, you do get a delay in the paperwork okay. process. And um, during this time, this four-week, four-month process, did you... Uh, the position that you so you obviously applied to a New York license because you must have uh, gotten a job offer in New York. Is that right? So was your job uh, yes. flexible with that, or did they say, "Hey, why don't you start working with your UP <laughs> Pennsylvania license?" And then we, while working, we'll work through the kinks. Were they supportive, or were they like, "Oh no, hands up"? I'm... Absolutely, okay. no. They were very okay. helpful. <laughs> yeah, they. You know, they know that you know new york state definitely uh is not the easiest to get licensed in okay overall. there's a lot more hoops to go through than in many other states yeah. um but you know they they know they they kind of plan oh, for okay. <laughs> possible problems um so yeah so i was able to work you know within limits of course um until my license came in. So they were definitely, you know, there was no push from them overall. They said, you know, your job is here. It's not a big okay. deal. You know, come do what you can do and help out where you can hey. help out. So yeah. that that's awesome. Yeah, they were super right. great. And, and, and so <laughs> yeah. um, and another thing that we keep hearing about and something that you alluded to before was that, um, oh, you know, if you're an IMG, you're just going to, you know, not have uh any opportunities in new york or even after you graduate and get ready even if you get residency you always have that stigma did you experience anything like that just by being an img no, okay not at all um you know i the program that like my residency program we're about 50 50 with regards to IMG okay. and you know u.s students so and the same within almost the entire Los Angeles Hospital was system was very large. So we had lots of programs, um, fellowships and so on. So, you know, you see a lot of diversity. So no one really cared at all. Everyone, like, you're more so known by just the fact like you are an IMG, but no one okay. cares because they just want to know what school and what island you're right, on. Right, okay. <laughs> So it really was more of a talking piece as opposed to a, oh, okay. no. Um, but they don't ever really bring that up at all after okay. the fact. So, um, and even looking for jobs in New York, not an issue. Okay, well, so, um, you know, from talking to a lot of our alumni as well as uh, current students, um, there is this is not really grounded in any fact or reality, but from uh, what I see that there doesn't seem to be um, any stigma against IMGs. If anything, it almost seems like uh, amongst all the IMGs, because when you talk about IMGs, you're talking about students from Eastern Europe, China, South Korea, India, Pakistan, and all these other places. Caribbean students almost have an edge, it seems like, because the program is geared towards the U.S. system, whereas these other programs are not, and, and whatever you're going through. But what is your experience? Do you think that you faced any sort of, quote-unquote, discrimination because you were an IMG, even when you were applying for residency or your rotation? No. Oh, yeah, no. You know, I honestly, in many ways, I felt like it kind of posed a slight advantage in certain okay. aspects because, you know, there are certain points where people are like, oh, you know, you're an IMG, okay. 
Uh, you know, sometimes their expectations may be a little different as opposed to expecting more out of like a U.S. student or okay. something like that. However, it gives us a unique opportunity to just work harder and better and prove that there is no difference. Right. Um, and on many rotations, you know, you you kind of see you see the difference in work ethic in many ways. Oh, wow. Um, because I think for most IMGs who, you know, this is what, you know, you really want and you work really hard for it, um, that they tend to actually outwork and, you know, outperform in right. many ways in order to kind of overcompensate for that proposed stigma, so to speak. Um, so I never found it as a disadvantage. Okay. Um, I was kind of used it more towards, you know, all right, well, they think or maybe they think they never actually voiced it, but maybe they think I'm not as good as the U.S. student or something. So I'm going right. to do, you know, X, Y, and Z to prove them wrong. And even program directors I've had in the past, they say that they prefer to have a 50-50 split of residents, um, IMG and U.S., because they do tend to find that the IMG resident does work okay. harder than the U.S. Oh, wow. student. Um, now, of course, that's not of always course. 100% yes. the case, um, but... From the experience that I've yeah. had, that's, you know, what I have seen and, you know, been yeah. voiced And I would to. almost think that that's because um, IMGs have been conditioned to expect an uphill task. Whether that's a reality or not, that's a different question. But when you're mentally prepared to face a lot of hardship, whereas, you know, and I'm going to be honest, we've had a lot of uh, preceptors um, whose uh, children are in some of the top medical programs here who reach out to us our school for resources because a lot of that is not necessarily done by them but uh and they don't even have to go through some of those uh preparatory phases that we put our students through so in order to have a better understanding and grounding for the residency application process a lot of students from a lot of our preceptors children have reached out to us saying hey you know my mom and dad are teaching your students we saw that they're exposed to this sort of kind of a, a a tool or 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 a database would you mind if i could get access to it and we do this all the time but uh, to your point i think that that actually speaks volumes that a lot of the american students just don't have to go through the rigors or the steps um that uh, imgs tend to focus on and whether they have to go through it or not, that's a different story, but they're mentally prepared for it. So Yeah, and I think I think that's not a bad right. thing in a sense, is like whether it's actually founded or not. But you know, when you do have that thought in the back of your head, like, do they think different because right. I went, you know, to permute school or not, then you you know, you do push right. a little bit harder. Right. And, <laughs> and that's what I tell our incoming students too. So when they're here, like I, I usually uh, try to go for most of the orientations and talk to the incoming students just to uh, give them a taste of what to expect because medical school is no cakewalk. And especially the program that you are in, it's an accelerated program. It's quicker than most U.S. programs uh, by about six to eight months. So, and that's a lot. You're cramming one full year's information. And and uh, you mentioned that you don't think you're very good at standardized tests. I would completely disagree with you <laughs> because you've aced uh, Continental uh, America's largest, I mean, the toughest exam in three parts. So you've obviously done all three. So what I do tell students is that when you come out of the program, you have two options. Is when you, uh, you can have a chip on your shoulder saying that, oh, I'm an IMG. Uh, and, or, and, and say that, oh, yeah, I'm at a disadvantage. Or you could tell yourself, as you pointed out, that this was actually an advantage and, and have a halo around your head and say that, hey, you know what? I am so much better because I was in a different country, adapting to a new culture, adapting to different people. Um, and uh, I organized health fairs where I was treating the local population and adjusting to their me means and methods of communication, which I would presume is very, very important for any physician, no matter what the specialty. And and obviously you have that international exposure, which in a globalized world, that is tantamount importance. I know that the AAMC is constantly beating the, beating its drums and uh, really worried about the fact that the American uh, medical student diaspora in the United States is not representative of the U.S. population. Uh, for example, the average number of African Americans in a medical program 
is bordering right around 18%. Um, whereas, say, if you come to St. James, the African-American population is closer to, uh, and, and other minorities, is closer to uh, 33%, which is much, uh, which resembles a lot of the patient population that you would probably see in your practice. Um, similarly, when it comes to financial uh, financials, like American medical schools have essentially become a beacon for the financially or academically privileged. I mean, I, uh, a student who uh, is getting into an American uh, uh, university for medicine, they need to be able to have the uh, bandwidth to get a quarter of a million dollars in loan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes, that sounds insane. Right. So, so, so by default, a lot of families who aren't necessarily at that means, and mind you, a quarter of a million dollars uh, loan, you know, the average income for a household in the United States is about ninety thousand dollars. That's the so essentially, like this is an this is an education field that the average American cannot afford, which is. Right. It's a yes. large deterrent. And, and yeah, whether absolutely. they're good students or not, some of the students don't even apply to uh, U.S. schools. We have a significant proportion of students in our programs who just thought that, you know what, I'm not even going to apply to U.S. schools because even if I get in, I can't afford it. And and I think that in that regard, yeah. like St. James or other IMG programs tend to be more reflective of the uh, U.S diaspora as opposed to what uh, doctors and students see here. So I think that that's a huge advantage because you're m mingling Absolutely. with people from different socioeconomic classes. You're mingling with students from different backgrounds. And that's what I always tell students. When you go out and go for those residency interviews, maybe that's something you should really talk about and not say, oh yeah, you know what, I'm an IMG. Instead of that, say, hey, I'm an IMG. I spent two years in a completely different country. I adapted to their culture. I treated these patients and I worked with the school and I studied in a school in a different country. That enriches me so much and makes me a better candidate. Yeah, absolutely. The experience is, it's unmatched. Um, you know, you don't get an opportunity like that in many cases. And yeah, you know, the financial piece of coming down to the island is very, very right. much appealing. Um, you do, you know, I would say, I never really thought about it until after the fact is how much value really figuring out myself saying I never really left right. home significantly. So I went from right. Pennsylvania university to a whole right. other country, you know, you start to grow and you figure it out while you're doing medicine. So there's a lot of growth that happens and a lot of experiences that you get that you take with you where, you know, not a lot of surprises okay. later on. And, you know, you kind of just keep going with the adversity that keeps coming <laughs> along because he went through an experience that how many other people are going to share. So <laughs> That's interesting. So you, the whole medicine okay. process, even after residency, you, you would categorize that as adversity? <laughs> no, you know? it's not easy. I, I, I get it. I, For lack of a better term, I think that that's the most apt uh, adjective for it because... <laughs> It, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, this is what I keep telling students. Accounting is a profession. Marketing is a profession. Being a doctor is a lifestyle. This is something that, you know, for me, as an accountant, I can be like, you know what? I have to prioritize my family. I'm going to uh, change my career to the needs and demands of my family. With all due respect, I just don't think a physician has that luxury because you're dealing with other human lives. So with that, I also want to ask you a little bit about residence because residency is obviously, that's essentially a, a, a job. That's the job that you're really gunning for from the day you start in medical school. Were your, right. what were your, what, what was going through your head when you were applying for residency? Oh, I think the main thing was, please let me match. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, no, you know, if you you really figure out what kind of doctor okay. do I want to be. Um, you know, what program is really going to give me the best ability to do what I really want to do and to help people in the way mm -hmm. I want to help them. 
Um, and you know, that's really where you look through all the programs and everything out there. It does get a little, uh, the vision gets a little blurry because right. there's so much and there's everything is available and it takes a little bit of sifting right. through. Um, but it was really about how I felt I would be right. better suited. Um, and it wasn't really about the location. It was really just what the hospital okay. had to offer. And honestly, I did look at prior rosters, prior okay. residents, not just only in family medicine, but in the other programs within the hospital, because that was an right. important part of, you know, the programs that I applied to, because I wanted to know that they were accepting of other IMGs and that it wasn't just a, you know, only U.S. student kind of shop, because that does change the appeal in okay. many ways. Um, so, you know, within that and really, you know, how do I want to train? Are these the, you know, Denise seem like the places that would best accept me, best train me in order to, you know, challenge me to really be the best doctor okay. that I can. And that was kind okay. of a big piece. So when you were going through the application so, process, do you think, so one thing I've noticed among our students who are applying for residency, um, a students tend to still treat the residency application like an academic application. Nothing wrong with that, but at the same time, I always try to remind students that the residency is a job. The reason it becomes infinitely right. more complex is because you can only apply for this job once a year. And one day in the year, do they let you know whether you got the job or not? And that's a little bit of a, in my opinion, that's that that should change eventually. And who knows if it will or not. <laughs> Yeah, oh, but, yeah. <laughs> but other countries, for example, like the United Kingdom, uh, I'm not sure about Canada, but the United Kingdom um, and almost all the European countries, even the Caribbean countries, they have a different approach where they say, hey, apply for a job when we have a vacancy, but just like any other job. You start and you start with a, a dependent or, or a junior license, a junior doctor. And then eventually, so there's no more steps, no residency. Um, you become a doctor as soon as med school. And then I think that there are positives and negatives to that, but which also begs to, right. brings to uh, spotlight is that American doctors do tend to be, not just American, but American and Canadian because of the system, tend to be much better trained than international physicians. No shade to any other country. <laughs> but that's, that's a fact. No, not at all, right. I mean, when you think about it, it makes it makes a little sense in certain ways. I mean, residency is is a lot. Um, no matter what specialty you go into, the expectations are high. And, you know, you go from a student to, you know, you know things, but you don't really know things. And then all of a sudden you're thrust into a job where you're expected to know things. And there is an actual human being in front of you. And you need to make the decision and you need to, you know, act quickly or understand at least the basics of what you're doing because it's someone's life in your hands. And, you know, that with residency, you know, you get in and it's overwhelming and extremely scary in the first bit. And then, you know, you're six months in and you feel better. You're more comfortable. But then imagine that. And then you're three years later, by the time, you know, you come out of residency and you're you know, it's it's not as as a scary transition as you would expect. Whereas if I feel like if I came straight out of medical school and someone told me that I had to be a doctor without residency, I would be very terrified. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine. But when you apply for residency, do you think you change the nature of your application from going applying to say med school versus applying to a residency program? I know the residency program, they make it look like a very academic um uh application process but the point is that when you're at the interview stage at the very least the program directors are treating you like a job applicant they're not treating you like an app uh yes. a, a, like a university would like a university right, eventually wants the best candidate but i think for the residency from what i've noticed the program directors tend to are less focused on okay is this the best candidate versus is this a person that i can work with that's what I mean by, and exactly. is that is something that you've experienced too? Okay. hundred um, percent. You, so the application, like the physical, you know, the physical application part, it's just that kind of stepping stone. You highlight all of the good parts, you highlight your certain skill, and that gets you in the door. But the actual interview and when you meet with people, 
they already know your academics. They know your scores. They know what school they don't, they really don't care. Obviously that was good enough to get you in the door. Uh, it then becomes, like you said, is this someone who's easy to work with? Do they seem hardworking? Um, you know, a lot of times I know when we did interviews, my question to a lot of my fellow residents was, could you spend 24 hours with this person in the call room? That was it. If the answer was yes, then, you know, we ranked them higher or, you know, they ducked up the list because everybody is, you're going to learn no matter what. You are thrust into an environment when it, where, whether it's either learn or something bad happens and no one ever wants anything bad to happen. So you're going to learn and those skills are going to develop. But your ability to change your personality to mesh with everybody else, it's not really there. So, you know, you really, a lot of it becomes, you know, those other extraneous things you don't quite think about in an interview. Um, prior to, you, you want to sell yourself, but you also want to be nor your normal self because that's really what you're going to be in residency. Especially, you know, they want to know how you handle the stress of a 24-hour call shift or you know, anything like that. And you really have, they, that's their goal of that interview is to get to the, you know, to who you are as actually as a person. So less of a, I got a 245 on step one and X, Y, and Z, you know, those things okay. don't matter anymore. It's more of what you bring to the table okay. for your team and for right. your program. So, so uh, when it comes to residency and, and the application, I one thing I've realized with our students is that they tend to hold back a lot of things that I would think are very, very pertinent. Uh, a, a, a case uh, in point is like uh, I was talking to one of our students who prior to med school was the general manager of uh, a, a, a fast food chain. Um, and and that- she never mentioned that. So in her resume, it looked like a gap year because she didn't want to mention. So when I saw her, I told her that, look, I mean, you're a, were the general manager of a national fast food chain. Um, and she was actually more than general manager. She was overseeing three different locations. <laughs> so, ah. um, and I told her that when you're applying for residency, don't you think it makes a lot more sense to actually say what you did in business terms? Because this is a lot of administrative responsibilities when you were looking after three locations, three disparate locations. You constantly had to drive around, yeah. make sure inventory is like- there and whatnot. And um, eventually, I she reworked her resume and she wrote her <laughs> personal statement on that. So my question to you is, do you yeah. think that that was good advice? Okay. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that, that tells a lot about somebody. Like even okay. sports, comp- if you did competitive sports in college, still bring okay. that up. All of those things, you know, they add to who you are okay. as a person jobs you've done, random skills that you may not think would be helpful to your resume. Okay. Think about them because they really may pose a, you know, an important piece later on that you may not really think about because, you know, why do I need to tell them this or okay. something like that? Uh, but really when you have, it's like that golden moment, right? You have that one moment to really make yourself shine and stand above the rest. You have to throw all your okay. cards on the table. You have to just lay it all out there or else, you know, everybody else kind of has stacked up right. similar resumes and similar applications. So you got to find the piece that's going to make you stand out or else you just kind of flow along all with right. everybody else. Well, I mean, I think uh, that's all the questions that I have. Do you have any suggestions for our students who are currently in MD? Because every time I meet them, they are stressed. <laughs> it's a stressful program. I'm not denying that. But at the same time, it seems <laughs> like uh, uh, we would want our students to go always go in the right direction. When you were in school, um, did you notice some behaviors that you were like, yeah, this guy needs to really pull his socks up or this girl really needs to pull her socks up before things will look up for them? Were there any major striking behavioral? I wouldn't even call it behavioral, but general routine issues that you saw that, yeah, this student needs to fix these things, then they will be successful. Because obviously you are a successful student. Yeah. You finished the program in record time. So you had all the cards stacked um, in your favor and you made the cards stack, be stacked in your favor. Is there something that you think our students can potentially do 
or have little checkpoints that, oh, okay, these are the things I need to do to make sure that I'm on track. Yeah, you know, it's, I would say not letting things really pile up okay. overall. You know, when you see a giant pile of things in your face because you let them go too long, that's when the stress comes and that's when you feel like it is a bigger mountain to climb than okay. it actually is. It's easy to stay on top of things when you take okay. it day by day. Um, you know, when you find that there are day and if you go a day or two without studying, that is okay. okay. <laughs> One or two days, it's, you know, it's kind of just a drop in the bucket when you really think about the rest of your career. Um, take the time to really evaluate your needs and what really is going to make you be a better student okay. overall. If you're, you know, struggling and, you know, your classes are, you know, daunting and things like that, find find the ways. There's always a way. And you just kind of really have to decide that this okay. is what you want. And, you know, the, the simple, you know, if you feel like you're just, I don't really care for this. It's not going to change from there. You know, it, this is a lifelong right. decision. It is a life when, you know, you don't really change course yeah, after it's that. It's not as big of a monetary investment, but it's yeah. still something. Yeah, it's a lifestyle. <laughs> So, yeah, so, you know, it's, you'll get there. It's just awesome. keep pushing. Uh, one last thing that I really wanted to talk to you about. I recently read this article and, and, and this is, um, I can't remember the source, but I will look at it and I'll try to put this up for this podcast with the link that a lot of the innovation, not innovation in the sense, scientific innovation, but the, the folks who tend to move the medical profession in the United States forward through entrepreneurial um, uh, endeavors and risk-taking and things like that are typically IMGs. And this article was very interesting. And I read this and I was like, oh my God, this is th this is huge. We, we should talk about this more. But the reason it is IMGs is because the average IMG has dramatically less debt than the uh, average American student, as a result of which they have a bigger appetite for risk taking, they have bigger entrepreneurial appetites, and they have a bigger appetite for innovation, whether it's uh, new methods in treating patients or, uh, you know, I mean, we had a podcast with Dr. Patel earlier, and he actually kind of alluded to this, that uh, he's a geriatric uh, physician, but he said that I pr practice geriatric, he's still a practicing physician, but he said, I practiced geriatric medicine in, in the confines of a hospital uh, for about three years. And then after that, I created a, a consulting firm that goes um, hospital to hospital and hospital system to hospital system, uh, telling them how exactly to minimize costs. And, and, and I was talking to him and I was like, how did you come up? I mean, this sounds so unique. And he was like, you know, honestly, one of the main reasons I could because I didn't have a half a million dollar debt that I needed to remain employed. I took this risk. And if things didn't work out, I would have gone back to being in a hospital. But things worked out great. And I have zero complaints about the amount of money. What are your thoughts on that? Like, is do you think that there's any merit to that kind of story where just because uh, the average American student, they I believe they come out with 300,000 plus in debt. Uh, which, assuming that they're starting to pay that at residency, a lot of them defer that, which is a huge mistake. And that balloons to over half a million by the time they finish their residency. And then they're struggling to make payments, despite the massive paycheck that doctors receive. But, I mean, at the end of the day, if you have six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars in debt <laughs> and your late what? 30s, I, I, I would think the logically it makes sense. But from a practicing physician, being an IMG, what's yeah. your thoughts? Yeah, you know, it's definitely, uh, you allow a little more flexibility, I think, which allows kind of for that okay. creativity in order to be, you know, thinking, well, you know, this job may not be, I'm not stuck kind okay. of with this job, you know, like you feel a little more free in okay. that respect. Um, 
which yeah kind of allows for that free you know that creativity and that independence to more of it i'm not strapped totally by this debt for a long time um and i can you know kind of climb out sooner rather than later which means i can make adjustments and take those chances right. when i want to because i have the ability financially okay. to um but then again, you know, you have the unique experience of the things that you go through on the island or as an IMG, and you can kind of use some of those as to how maybe you want to change your practice or okay. change the way someone does something or anything like that. Because, you know, you weren't just, you know, in one area, you know, training and seeing the similar kind of patient population, but you had, you know, the different diverse people, different okay. country of people. And, you know, you get a lot of that exposure that you may not have. You know, in certain other areas oh, wow. in the country. So, I mean, it definitely sounds like uh, going to, I mean, I wouldn't call it a disadvantage, but going to an American school and racking up that sort of debt, it just sounds crippling almost. Because, and then there were so many testimonials yes. from surgeons even saying that, you know what, I mean, I'm stuck. I can't really do what I want to do because I have to clear my debt. And they're like, I'm in my 40s and... You know, I'm I'm still no right. not even fifty percent through my debt. So, uh, but that's awesome. What about you personally? What are your future plans? Um, you know, <laughs> I am just in my within my first year of practicing, so I'm pretty okay. flexible. I'm waiting for my husband okay. to finish residency. Um, so you know we're he's an IMG as well, so we're okay. kind of. If you don't mind, you know, we're, we're may open. I ask which school yeah. is he from? Is he from? He's from oh, ours. We met. Fantastic! On the this is great. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. The, but I mean, and and that's fantastic. Where is he doing residency? Um, he's actually here at um Upstate that's Medical fantastic. University doing radiology. That's fantastic. And, well, and I mean, if radiology. when he's done with his residency and he has more time, we would love to have him. <laughs> And we would love sure. to have you and him both come down to the island. And as I mentioned, we actually have a very impressive roster of visiting faculty. So r right now we have two visiting faculty. One is uh, from Detroit Medical Center, the head, head of anesthesiology and the head of oncology at Loyola University here in Chicago. So huh? we would love to have you okay. and your husband both come in and check out the <laughs> island. And uh, so, Absolutely. so as far as personal plans are concerned, it's just you're waiting for him, and then yeah, um, yeah, and then you come and see. We'll see where the next job awesome. takes us. You know, we uh, we like to be a little flexible with everything and really take advantage of the time that we have to explore. That's, a little that's bit. amazing. <laughs> um, and uh, so you know, with that, well, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. So that's all the ha time we have for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Lou, for your time. And I know you're extremely busy uh, moving into a new uh, practice and everything. But we really appreciate all the nuggets of information that you've given us as well as our uh, current student base. I think this will be extremely important. But uh, again, I mean, one thing I want to remind our viewers and our students uh, is that, as I always say, there is no shortcut to getting an MD. And as Dr. Lou mentioned, it is a lot of hard work, but this hard work builds on itself and makes you a much better physician in the long run. Again, thank you so much for tuning in and don't forget to uh, follow and like our video and download other episodes of this podcast from all the major platforms, including Spotify, Google, and Apple. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning into our show. We hope you enjoyed another episode of Med School Minutes. If you like our content, please follow us and receive notification when a new show is posted. This podcast is brought to you by St. James School of Medicine. For a video version of this podcast, please check us out on sjsm.org video.